That was brutal. There is no way to spin it. The Golden State Warriors now trail 2-1 in a best of seven uh, to the Los Angeles Lakers, making game four that much more pivotal, that much more important. I have Greg Silver joining me, the host of a, a fun podcast uh, called Screaming from the Sidelines. We're going to break down what went wrong and why there's no panic buttons being pressed, at least for me. Uh, so sit down and, and enjoy the ride. This is Locked on Warriors. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You could follow Greg Silver, the host of Screaming from the Sidelines, available on all podcast uh, uh, platforms, on Twitter at Greg O. Silver, O being O-H. And you can follow me, Cyrus Otzes, on Twitter at Dog Surf Rocho. Greg, great to see you on a Saturday night. Uh, your immediate reaction to just an ugly, embarrassing game on so many levels, 127-97 the final, and that score, it makes him seem more positive than it actually was, in my humble opinion. Greg, great to see you, and your immediate reaction to that ugly game. Yeah, thank you for having me, Cyrus. It's nice to be here. I'm, I'm a big fan of Locked On Warriors, and I wish I was here under uh, happier circumstances, to say the <laughs> least. I mean, that was... That was a pretty brutal one. I would say my instant reaction, and I know we're going to kind of go through all of it step by step, but uh, yes, the Warriors did not play well, but when the referees stopped all momentum and just completely slowed the pace of the game, and on top of that, Draymond not really able to play defense with the fouls they were calling on him. So yeah, it was really frustrating all around. I hated watching that entire second half. I feel bad for my girlfriend who was watching with me. She had to endure my terrible mood for about two hours so uh... <laughs> I'll, I'll this is I'll, i will reveal my personal side I don't, I don't like to get too personal on this show but i will reveal something personal here i have had more than one relationship end in my life serious relationships romantically because of sports because m more times than not it was the niners just because the warriors were so irrelevant in my younger years that i was never put in a position where a loss could be so devastating that my mood would be altered that much but the Niners had quite a few like NFC championship losses playoff losses where relationships were over I basically was put in a position where uh it was either the team or the partner and I just said bye peace out because the team's always going to be there um maybe it wasn't the right choice but that's how it went so I totally understand your situation man and and if your girlfriend put up with it and she was cool about it I think you got to keep her man I, I don't know what her reaction was but uh <laughs> what was no no she's like no, she's okay. She uh, she handles things pretty well. She's a big U of A fan, and we actually went to the Arizona-Princeton game when Princeton knocked them out in the first round, and I have to say she handled it about 15 times better than I would have and was still sad. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely the mess when it comes to sports, and I think that's why we get along. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, well, here's what I want to do. I, I'm going to ask you this question first. Let me know if you agree with me or not. Uh, you know, role players obviously play so much better at home than they do on the road, right? I, I don't think it was any surprise that uh, players like Austin Reeves, for example, who in my opinion is a glorified role player, uh, was persona non grata in games one and two. Tonight he plays 30 minutes, puts up 10 points, but he was a plus 31, led the whole game in plus minus. Uh, you know, n nothing really stuck out on the, st on the stat sheet except that he actually looked like a player who was out playing Steph Curry. I mean, I, I was, I was, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing in a lot of those those situations. But you saw Lonnie Walker, who we hadn't seen in this series, show up tonight. Uh, Dennis Schroeder was three for six from beyond the arc. And by the way, all six of those three point attempts were wide open. I don't know why the Warriors yes. are just letting them shoot these things wide open. But my, my point is, role players usually step up uh, in, in games when they're at home versus on the road. So in a lot of ways, like. Um, my my summary of this game was it was like game one again, except because we were in L.A. and not in San Francisco. You saw a lot of the Lakers role players hitting shots that may or may not have normally made. And uh, we see this 30 point gap in, in, in the point differential between, between the two teams. Um, but the ref situation, I thought we were going to be over that. And I hate 
I despise having to resort to pointing NBA officials out, but you have to tonight. This was utterly ridiculous. We're going to obviously break down like the free throw disparities, uh, certain specific plays that were just really biased and unfair, very one-sided. Um, but is that a fair assessment, I guess? This was basically game one again, except because we're in L.A., the role players are going to do a lot better. So it's not going to be a five-point game. It'll be a much bigger game, sadly, 30. Uh, anything you want to add to that? Do you agree, disagree? Your thoughts to that? No, I actually pretty wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said. Like, the Lakers did play better than us. They did have a huge impact defensively. Curry was dribbling around the paint a lot, but not really putting up shots because Anthony Davis did have a really good game. You know, it seems like it's an every other game kind of affair with him, but credit to Anthony Davis that he did play well, especially defensively. And yeah, I, I think it's a little bit funny that I'm coming on here for the first time, just hoping to not sound whiny and talk about the refs, but there's really no way to dance around that. No. Um, we're going to talk about the refs, uh, obviously, because they, they played such a huge part in this game. Um, I heard Mike Breen, for example, on more than one occasion, uh, you know, quote out how fantastic of a performance this was for the Lakers. Of course, any team will look fantastic when they're when they go to the free throw line uh, for 37 free throw attempts. Uh, the Warriors had 17, and Greg, you mentioned before we started uh, recording that you were keeping track of the, the fourth quarter free throw attempts because before the garbage time in it started, which was really early in the fourth quarter, um, the, the disparity was egregious. Uh, so we're, we're going to get to that in just a minute. But to me, this game went south in the second quarter, and the reason why I say that is because the Warriors were leading in the second quarter 40-29. to 29. They had this game under control. Uh, at the 7.53 mark of the second quarter, Moses Moody made a three-pointer. I love that seeing Moody play. I think he's a massive plus for this team. And that three-pointer made the score 40-29. to 29. Warriors are in control. Everything's looking good. And that's when everything also started to spiral out of control and the snowball started to accumulate as it's rolling down the hill. And this is what happened, all right? And this whole sequence is what turned the entire game around. Sorry to relieve it, relive it, folks, but it's important. Um, Anthony Davis made, made a, a layup following a bad Stephen Curry turnover, and the Warriors had a lot of bad turnovers. Um, Anthony Davis uh, gets another rebound, and they call a foul on Moses Moody. Uh, Anthony Davis makes another shot. Clay Thompson turns it over. Stephen Curry is called for a foul that LeBron makes two free throws out of. Uh, Dominic Tate DiVincenzo misses a shot. I'm sorry, two shots. Uh, th then uh, we continue on. LeBron James makes a bucket. Uh, after St uh, Draymond Green missed that three-pointer, which I think you remember, it was just kind of ugly. He was wide open, though. What are you going to do? But what, what really started to turn is that that flagrant foul they called on Moses Moody. It was a flagrant foul plus a take foul. And at that point, again, I don't, I didn't see anything there that was obvious. To me, it just looked like Moses Moody was on the ground. Yes, he moved his arm. Um, it could have been incidental as much as uh, intentional. But that, but after that play, uh, and then Austin Reeves made two uh, free throws from that. Um, soon after that, LeBron James made a 24-foot step back jumper. The Lakers take the lead, and they never look back. And it was over from there. And you can look at the rest of the second quarter, and it's just endless fouls. It's endless turnovers. Uh, and and the, again, the free throw disparity was ugly tonight. It was for uh, 17 free throw attempts for the Warriors, 37 for the Lakers, but the turnovers were ugly too. The Warriors had 19 turnovers to just 12 for the Lakers, and the Warriors' offense wasn't there. Um, regardless of what you want to say about the officials impacting this game, the offense was atrocious. They were held to under uh, 50 points at the half. They only had 48. They only had 68 points at the end of the third. Um, couldn't break the 100-point mark. Uh, what did you see, man? Like, in your opinion, was there any specific reason as to why uh, the Warrior that everything went out of control? Is it just the refs? What did you see with the offense? Was there anything that stuck out to you there? I guess we'll, we start with that. Yeah, so I thought that coming out of the halftime break, there was an opportunity when we might see the Warriors regather themselves a little bit and maybe find a little bit of a spark, kind of get back into this game, kind of bury the whole ref narrative in the second quarter. And we didn't see that. A lot of it was missed shots. A lot of it was just kind of mindless turnovers. Anthony Davis had four blocks, I believe. I don't, even, I don't know if he got up to a fifth, but uh, just all around really, really ugly. And I thought the second quarter, it was really derailing with uh, calling a couple of cheap fouls on Wiggins. You know, Draymond gets his third foul on an overturned challenge. And then when he gets his fourth, the Warriors challenge it, and they uphold it. Then his fifth foul comes 
on something that clearly should have just been no call going to the basket. And then on top of that, uh, Clay Thompson was getting called for a couple of offensive fouls for Mm. uh, hardly doing anything. I mean, I don't even think I saw a full extension. And again, I hate to be the guy to just complain about the whistle over and over. But I complain, complain, bitch, do it all, man. It's tonight's the night to do it because that was egregious. Continue on. Sorry to interrupt you. No, I was just going to say that I don't think any neutral basketball fan, meaning not a fan of the Warriors or the Lakers, could look at that game and call it even by any means or like there was any level of consistency. It was just – it took all the life out of the game. Uh, I thought there was a little bit of life. You know, that Andrew Wiggins poster, I was like, whoa, I like seeing mad Andrew Wiggins. This is cool. Uh, that gave us a little bit of hope, but then quickly it was just more turnovers. Uh, I thought when Jordan Poole – drove on the baseline and LeBron James just rejected him so hard. I thought that was the most predictable play of my entire life that I've watched. Um, And yeah, so really any chance at momentum and putting something good together, they just, they did not have. So the ugliness was fully there in addition to uh, just very bad luck on the referee front, the flagrant foul on Moses Moody. I don't understand that. I thought the, the, the technical foul on Draymond Green, by the way, like, that wasn't one of those, oh, by Draymond standards, that was nothing. That was by a player standard, that was really nothing. And I don't know exactly what was said, but what constitutes a technical foul for anybody in the NBA playoffs now is just mind-boggling when the stakes are high. And uh, like DeAnthony Melton yesterday got one for sticking his foot out and kicking the ball on the Sixers Celtics games. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know that's a technicality and it's a rule, but how are we impacting meaningful playoff games by things like that. It just doesn't make sense to me. I I I'm I agree, man. Nothing was sensical tonight. We're gonna break it down more. I, I we gotta I'm gonna have to call out I don't know about you, Greg, but I'm gonna have to call out Clay. This was just not a good game by Clay. Uh, he, he followed up a brilliant performance in game two with an egg. And, and yeah, I, I mean there were a lot of clips of him in this game where he was upset about these foul calls. But I mean if you know you had a chance to score some buckets. You know, he played 33 minutes and in those 33 minutes, he only scored 15 points. Um, you know, nothing impactful. We'll break it down. And we're going to talk about what adjustments the Warriors may make, what you and I think they will make uh, after I give some love to uh, prize picks. Greg, have you ever played prize picks, by the way? Are you a gambling person on that note? I'm very curious. A little bit of gambling. I do use betonline.ag because that's our beloved uh, belief sponsor, but uh, prize picks is something I haven't dabbled in personally myself. That said, my younger brother and my friends do it all the time, so I can't hang out with them without hearing about it. Love prize picks. <laughs> well, the official sports book of of Locked On is uh, FanDuel. I gotta get, I gotta mention that. But uh, one thing that's really annoying is every time I get FanDuel love uh, for a sponsor, um, I can't play it because it's not legal in California. But Greg, you and I here in California can play prize picks, and that goes for anyone else watching. That's one of the huge perks why. I really got into it. I was like, oh my God, I could actually do this. And it's just on my phone and it's user friendly. And, and then the whole premise of price picks is over unders, right? Points, rebounds, assists. It's not just basketball either. Um, so chances are Anthony Davis probably killed his OUs tonight. Uh, if, if you bet on him for price picks, he was magnificent. He was, I mean, it didn't hurt that the refs were giving him uh, every other point, but still great game from Anthony Davis. So you could have won money there. You could have bet unders on Clay Thompson and Steph Curry's totals. That's what the sport, that's what price picks is all about over unders and uh, on individuals, minimum of two players, maximum of six players. And you can win up to 25 times your money. And one of the best parts and Greg, I'm sure you can uh, sympathize in with this super fast and easy, easy withdrawals. There's no like sketchy wire services. There's no delay. You can get your money back immediately which is super awesome so download the price picks app or go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports first time users can receive a 100 instant deposit match up to 100 dollars with the promo code locked on meaning you put in 100 bucks they will give you 100 bucks you're gonna have 200 bucks to play with right off the bat and if you don't have 100 bucks you only got 50 25 to start with whatever the amount is price picks will match it so you double what you get to play with don't forget to enter the promo code locked on to sign up for an instant deposit match of up to one hundred dollars. You are locked on Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day.
Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. Every dayers, uh, I don't know what's going on in the show next, but follow us on Twitter at Locked On Dubs. That's where we post all our start times, who our guests are. And Greg, I can't thank you enough for 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 uh, joining me last minute. Uh, you can follow Greg Silver on Twitter at Greg O Silver. That's Greg O H Silver. Uh, game four, man. I, I I'm not hitting any pat panic buttons whatsoever. This game to me was not representative at all of who the Warriors are uh, or who the Lakers are, for that note. Um, I'm expecting a completely different game in Game 4. Uh, I'm going to really hope that a lot of the sports talk shows are going to highlight just how ridiculous the refereeing is, and that'll put some pressure on the league, hopefully, to slow down this asinine free throw disparity that's, that's been going on now for two to three games. Uh, just to remind people, the free throw disparity tonight, the Lakers had a total of 30 seven free throw attempts that is a lot and the warriors had 17 what was the count for you because because you started counting actually before garbage time which started at like the nine or ten minute mark of the fourth quarter what was the free throw disparity at that point so free throws i don't have the exact number on that one i think the warriors had about 11 uh total attempts and the lakers were somewhere up in the 30s but it was the foul count that i was looking at too because i actually yeah. saw a comment in the chat bringing up the total and it was like pretty even by the end of the game but i stopped it at the nine minute mark and was like okay what's the real foul count 21 for the lakers and 15 for the warriors which actually it felt way or sorry re reverse that 21 for the warriors and and 15 against the lakers and uh that's it, it felt way worse uh, than that to me but the free throw disparity was insane anthony davis had more free throw attempts than the warriors i think uh maybe it got about equal by the time garbage time when, and yes, I know he's a big player. I know he plays inside, and some of those were fouls. He deserved to get to the line. He had a good game. Okay, this isn't like the take everything away from Anthony Davis game, but it's a fair illustration of what goes on just beyond the uh, normal factors of yeah. how the teams play and the Warriors being a jump shooting team. You don't get two of three games with 20-point difference on disparity it just feels a little bit ridiculous. And the Lakers coming back home for the first time and then having that kind of show put on in the second quarter by the men in the zebra stripes, uh, it was really disappointing to see. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and so, so so through three quarters, uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because the refs, I'm guessing, were probably calling a lot more fouls than the Lakers to make that number seem fair and so they're not called out as much. But through the first three quarters of this game, the Warriors had a total of eight free throw attempts the Los Angeles Lakers had 33 Anthony Davis through the first three quarters of this game had more free throw attempts individually than the Golden State Warriors did as a team Anthony Davis finished the game uh, I finished uh, through three quarters with 10 free throw attempts the Warriors had just eight I saw Stephen Curry get hit a lot tonight he had a whopping total of two free throw attempts now one player in the Warriors had more than two free throw attempts meanwhile for the Lakers LeBron had eight oh I'm no, sorry that's just uh, uh quarters one through three uh let me let me look at the total total I'm sorry uh so Anthony Davis finished with 12 free throw attempts LeBron had eight Austin Reeves had seven how is Austin Reeves getting to the line that much more than Stephen Curry I, I it drives me insane so yeah the officials had a huge part in this game um what do you see happening in game four uh, a name that has really been highlighted now because we're not seeing him play at all at all except for garbage time is Jonathan Kaminga um he's six eight he's athletic uh he had a great regular season he was part of the rotation until game one of the NBA playoffs um in your opinion uh what do you think's going on there man why do you think Jonathan Kaminga has fallen out of favor with Steve Kerr it's interesting to me because on paper, it does make a lot of sense. Like the Kings were a very different team than the Lakers. And I'm not surprised that, that we fell in game one because the Kings were great and they wore it out of us. I mean, it touched, it took Steph Curry touching God in game seven to even still be in the playoffs here. So uh, game one, I understood why they were a little bit tired until they had that spurt at the end. And it's a different play style that you have to adjust to. So Kaminga seems like a person that on paper works great for the Lakers. He is young, athletic, explosive, and statistically he has been very efficient, which I know you've talked about on the show time and time again. Now, I am usually quicker to defend Steve Kerr than uh, a lot of other disgruntled fans just because I 
try to be grateful for all the four championships. And I think his problem solving throughout the dynasty has been incredibly underrated along with just emotional intelligence. So well, you know with Kaminga, right? Do you, are you friends with them? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. So, and you know, thing, and I want to make one thing very clear, Greg, I don't, I'm not an anti, I've never once called for his head. I've never said, said fire Kerr. That's I'm not going to that extreme. And until this season, I've been an ardent supporter of his Still am, but it's, there's just been some nonsensical things. By the way, I also figured out why so many things were nonsensical, and we could talk about that next segment or another show, which is Kenny Atkinson's like insane influence and and, and the analytics that he loves. I, I, I'm seeing that now. I started to digress. I just wanted to let let people know that. No, no, no. And, and for the record, I don't see you as like some unfair Kerr hater. Like you are a Thanks, very man. passionate fan. Like Thank me, you. it's like you when you do a show about a team five days a week and the Warriors experience the kind of ups and downs that they did all this season, you're going to have to find things to be annoyed about. And Thanks, I agree. I don't Thanks, like you. seeing Anthony Lamb play. Like if Anthony Lamb is out on the floor, it's either a really good thing or a really bad thing based on the <laughs> scoreboard. And uh, so with Kaminga, I agree. On paper, it does make sense. I don't know exactly why. He hasn't earned the trust card with Steve Kerr if it's uh, something just beyond analytics and the Kenny Atkinson show going on. <laughs> I will say to spin something a little bit positively is that I want more Moses Moody because all playoffs, he has worst case been neutral and fine and best case been really, really nice to see for a yeah. guy that was pretty much buried in the rotation. So I'm a yeah. big fan of Moses Moody. I want to see him out there. I'm not exactly sure why GP2 – uh, isn't playing as much in this series. Could just be a matchup thing, but uh, I like getting these young guys out. You know, DiVincenzo in general is a really hard – he plays really hard and has great yeah. effort. He hasn't been uh, performance-wise not that great throughout this postseason, but he's someone who I'm still okay giving 10 minutes to off the bench because he, you know, is always going to be a hustle guy and, you know, make things happen even if he's not having a great game. So that's kind of where I stand on the role players and – I don't know what your thoughts on all that are. No, I, I'm with you. I love Moses Moody. I've been an advocate for him all season. I, I to me, Moody and Kaminga are both great players. Um, if they're not great uh, by definition, I think they're on their way there. But I don't think they're detriments, man. Like I, I don't see them hurting the team if they play. Uh, my, my, and it wasn't even Anthony Lamb so much that Drew Meyer this year. It was much more um, uh, uh, Ty Jerome. I, I never understood that. Like Moses Moody got how many DNPs? I mean. He didn't play in 19 Warriors games this year. Those weren't, I don't think those were all DNPs because he was in Santa Cruz for some of those, but that's the part I didn't understand. I, I, I thought if you played him and Kaminga 25 minutes throughout the season, working on them, developing them, they'd be like giving you legitimate solid minutes right now. I didn't get the, 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 given the two way players, the, the runs they did. I mean, and look now, how is that paying off? Like it didn't pay off at all, but that was my main issue this year. I just didn't understand that part of it. What are you seeing in game four, man? You and I both sound like we, we wouldn't mind seeing Kaminga play. Uh, Moses Moody, I would love to see. And I don't think he played enough tonight. Like in game two, he played 25 minutes. Um, tonight, uh, if you take out the fourth quarter where he played six minutes, uh, Moody played 14 minutes, basically, 13 to 14. Real minutes, like where he was contributing. I'd like to see more of that. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I like seeing Jermichael Green out there. He played a whopping total of 11 minutes tonight. Um, I don't think he hurts the team. I think his size is beneficial. He does space the floor, even though he was over three from beyond the arc tonight. Um, he's, he's dangerous enough out there. Like there was one play, for example, where Jermichael put the three up and it drew Anthony Davis out of the key. And so, and even though Jermichael missed the three, the Warriors got an offensive rebound and a putback. And that was largely because Anthony Davis was drawn away from the basket to defend Jermichael. Um, what are you expecting to see in game four? I mean, is there going to be much of anything? Like, what are your thoughts on that? I want to say this. I don't think they need to do a ton of lineup changes, especially with, like, your main rotation. Jermichael Green doesn't have to be anything special if he's in the starting lineup. But he does bring Anthony Davis out of the paint, like you just said. And it worked great in game two, Steph Curry was able to play more freely. He was passing the ball. Clay Thompson was getting into his spots. He was finding a little bit of a flow. And to anyone in the chat right now who's talking about, yes, the Warriors lost the game. I, no one, neither me or Cyrus is going to say that the Warriors deserved to win this game and they played better. But what I do want to say is that when you think about the strengths of the best players on our team, they were all stripped away in the second quarter. And I actually really liked what I saw when it got all the way up to 40 to 29, I was really liking the way our team 
uh, was flowing. I thought there was good poise. But when there's a break in play every 20 to 30 seconds, you're out on the court. That's not good for someone like Steph Curry, who is such a rhythm guy. It's not good for Klay Thompson, who no- likes to get to his spots. It's not good for Draymond Green, who is so invaluable on the defensive end, and he can't really play defense against Anthony Davis anymore. Uh, Kavon Looney, I love Kavon Looney, but this has been a tough series for him thus Agreed. far, and that's okay. It, like, if that's okay. He doesn't have to be the man in every single matchup that we face. So we need Draymond Green to play valuable minutes and we didn't have our best defender and we had a lot of disruption, which just really kind of broke the flow of the game. And you saw it in the third quarter. They didn't have flow. They were turning it over unnecessarily and any kind of open look they were getting, it really just didn't fall. You're absolutely right, man. Um, I want to, and real, and just to, to, to piggyback off that, at the end of the first quarter, the Warriors led this game 30 to 23. The free throw disparity, the Warriors had five attempts, the Lakers had six. All right. And then building off that, the Warriors led this game 40 to 29 in the second quarter. And just like you said, I, I just want to repeat this just because the emphasis I feel is strongly needed. This game was in control for the Warriors until the referees decided to blow that goddamn whistle every single time it felt like the Lakers had the ball. Anthony Davis, I, 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 it just, I, I honestly, I'm trying to think of like a possession where Anthony Davis did not get the whistle in his favor. Like every single time, Draymond Green can effectively guard Anthony Davis when the referees are not helping Davis, and it's absurd, man. I hate pulling this referee card. Uh, if you watch the show on a daily basis, if you're an everydayer, you will know that I do not bring up the refs that often, but. It, it's warranted, man, because this is now twice in three games, and it is easily the single biggest difference in, in this series is the, the Lakers consistently going to that damn line and getting free points. Uh, you know, and again, for tonight, they got a whopping total of 28 free throws. That's 28 points, just free points. The Warriors got 12 free throws. So so the, the, the attempts disparity was 37 to 17. In terms of makes, the, dis, the difference was 28 to 12, and that literally – changed the momentum of this game. It brought the Lakers back. It woke that crowd up who was just who fell asleep because the Warriors were just pulling away. They literally made a profound difference in this game. Now, if we're going to move on from the from the referees, uh, there are two players that I want to point out. One is one you just mentioned, which is Kevon Looney. I love Looney. I'm sure you do too. Any Warriors fan loves Looney. But Looney does have his limitations. There's a reason why he is not an all-star. And he's not built for every series. Last year in the first round, for example, against the Denver Nuggets, um, he was schooled by Nikola Jokic. He fell out of the rotation almost entirely. And that's when we started seeing Jordan Poole starting with the Splash Brothers. And, and you know, I've, I've mentioned this earlier in the playoffs, how there was that brief moment a year ago where we were trying to come up with like cute nicknames for the threesome and because they were on fire for a brief moment. But that largely the catalyst for that was largely Kevon Looney playing poorly in the first round. Draymond Green came in. The officials did not help Nikola Jokic out. And we saw a fair series where Draymond Green exhibited why he's one of the greatest defenders in the history of this game. Um, so the Looney thing is, is interesting because he's he's not making a, a positive difference in this series. Uh, Anthony Davis has his number. Uh, he has a hard time even affecting LeBron James. Um, so in your mind, like, again, Kaminga like, seems like the logical choice to in terms of where to fit him in, Looney's minutes seem like the obvious choice. Looney played 15 minutes tonight. You could reduce that to 10. He played 11 in game two, and that felt like plenty. You could even reduce that more if you want and get a little creative so you can integrate Jonathan Kaminga into the lineup. And again, what you get with Kaminga is a 6'8 athletic freak uh, who can just attack the paint, um, who is a good outside shooter. Contrary to what people say, the numbers do not uh, support any argument that says he's not a, he's a bad shooter. He's not. Even tonight in garbage time, uh, he was three for four from the field, made his one three-point attempt, scored 10 points. I know it was garbage time, so it's hard to base anything on that. But the Kevon Looney thing, um, I just I guess anything to add to that? I know you brought it up earlier, but it's worth mentioning that he, this is just not the series for him. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I got two things. One is that even if this isn't the series for Kevon Looney, you still have to use him because that's valuable minutes, rest for other guys, and it is fouls. Like, 
I don't want the Warriors to be fouling. You know, it's probably not going to be like it was in game two all the time. And hopefully it's not like it was in games one and three either. It's probably going to be somewhere in between. And Looney can eat up three fouls for you if they're smart fouls stopping a good shot inside for LeBron or Anthony Davis or one of these other guys. So Looney is always going to be someone who works hard and gives you good minutes. Now, that doesn't mean you have to play him 30. Maybe it's 10, like you just said. Uh, the second thing I wanted to add on the note of Kaminga is I'm no NBA coach and I'm not an expert in rotations, but just knowing this team and how they play, I would love to see JK out there with experienced and trusted players as a way of like keeping him on a little bit of a, a tighter leash and not making him do so much. Like put him in a lineup with Curry and Draymond out there together so he can just do the simple plays. You got two of the great brains out there along with him. And he doesn't have to be freaking out when he's getting into some rare playoff minutes. That's kind of what I would like to see is the next step for Kaminga. I think Moody has shown he is incredibly mature. Uh, mm -hmm. He's always talked about being like the adult in the room at age 21. But also the way he plays, you can tell he's just kind of ready for the moment. Uh, so I like Moody a lot. I would like to see Kaminga just get a chance with maybe a better lineup where you have guys out there you trust a little bit more. And maybe not in a lineup where it's like, Pool, DiVincenzo, Kaminga, Jermichael Green, and uh, Clay or something like that. that. That's kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And and for the few people in the chat who are coming in here, uh, you know, like, for example, uh, someone, this individual named Brian uh, Ushiat. I, I apologize if I mispronounced your last name. How about the 30 moving screens that are uncalled for? Look, that's your opinion. I don't see them. Um, but one thing that, that the reason why we're bringing up the refs is because, again, they led 30-23 to 23 after the first quarter. They were leading uh, well into the second quarter, 40-29, to 29, for good reason. And then all of a sudden, the refs got themselves involved in this game. They took Draymond Green out of the game. And that's really where it all it all kind of started to, to uh, snowball from there. Um, you know, the, the Lakers have showed this pattern this postseason of not being able to maintain consistency uh, on a game-by-game on -game basis. Uh, Anthony Davis and LeBron James, they'll have a great game. Then they'll have a horrible game. Uh, and that pattern is pretty uh, consistent. Uh, do you think that's going to continue on in game four? Uh, and anything else you, you feel like we might see uh, in terms of adjustments for the Warriors? Game four is very much a must win because coming back from 3-1 against arguably the smartest player of all time that this game has ever seen, who's still doing what he's doing at the age of 38, I think is a very, very tall task for this team. But if the Warriors can adjust and win game four, however necessary, you know, assuming they're all healthy, if they got a best of three with two home games, I love that situation. I have not once been stressed out this whole series. Game one, I expected them to be tired. Game two, they responded. And tonight, yeah, it was incredibly frustrating and I'm pissed off, but I'm not hitting the panic button out here. Yeah. I think Monday, uh, if they lose the game, then maybe it's time to hit the panic button, uh, regardless of how that happens. But I'm hoping it can get to 2-2 and we get a little bit of a best of three. And I will take my chances with Curry, Clay, Draymond, Looney, and the rest every time. You know, it, I always say this to my friends uh, when Clay has had his inconsistencies. I say that I will stand by Clay Thompson even on his worst day. I love it. Yeah, Clay did not have a great game tonight. Uh, finished the game shooting 5 of 14 from the field, 3 of 9 from beyond the arc. That wasn't so bad, but um, finished with just 15 points. Uh, uh, had six turnovers. Um, that really sticks out. Uh, and Stephen Curry had three turnovers on that same note. Um, Draymond Green, we only saw him play 22 minutes because of the foul trouble, which is annoying to no end. Um, what are your thoughts on Jordan Poole, man? He finished the game tonight with 22 points. I think some of those were in garbage time, but he's a player who, um, you know, when you look at the media landscape, uh, I, I feel like I've defended him more than almost any other media member this whole season. Uh, I, I constantly pointed out his scoring average, how he's... He is a mentally strong individual. I, I, I do believe that firmly. But um, he also can be a liability. In the same way that Kevon Looney, this may not be a series for him. Uh, I'm not really seeing much of an impact from Jordan Poole. Uh, you know, he's, he's a turnstile defensively. Uh, there's some plays that really stick out on my mind that are egregious in terms of his defense. Um, and then offensively, I, you know, I, it's just nothing's really sticking out for me. And tonight, 22 minutes, he was just two for nine from the field missed all four of his three-point attempts, finished the game with just five points. Your thoughts on Jordan Poole, man? Because I just don't know if this is the series for him. Your thoughts? Yeah, Poole's a really 
interesting one. He's a total enigma. And I mean, he's younger than I am, which we kind of have to remember, which is hard when you have a great core that maybe has, maybe it's two games they have left together, or maybe it's three years. You know, we don't know the answer for sure, but we have to capitalize on this window now. And that's hard when you're watching a 23 year old kid out there, try to mature a little bit. Uh, He was great in the playoffs last year. I firmly believe they don't win that championship without Jordan Poole. And so I want to give him his credit for that. I have been very hard on Poole a lot this year just because it feels like whether he does something good or bad, he's always on the floor. He's just a little out of control. And I thought the first quarter and a half of this game, in those first eight minutes he was out there, he actually looked uh, really focused and in control. And like his head was up and uh, there was one play where they kicked it out to him on the wing and he actually made an extra pass to Wiggins for a great shot who drilled a three. And I thought that was a really high IQ play by someone that can seem like a deer in the headlights out there at times. And so, yeah, it's tricky. And I think to win any series in this postseason for the Warriors, they're going to need pool. Like as much as I hate to say that and don't want to see him play a bunch of minutes. Now you can have him on a tight leash. You don't have to be playing pool uh, 30 minutes in a lot of games. And I will say that it seems like the notable difference for pool is that if he makes, or he's taking open shots rather it's fairly reliable. He is pretty reliable on the open shots. Free throws, there's been a massive drop-off from last year, and especially on the shot creation front, it's been a lot of bad looks that aren't close. They're not uh, what would be defined as good misses by basketball coaches, or they're just kind of unnecessary turnovers, which can be just such a stinger for this Warriors team. So I'm not saying Poole needs to be pulled. I do believe he's needed to win any series, but uh, I would just like him to speed up the game in his head and slow it down with his feet. If that makes sense. Uh, you know, no, no, absolutely. does make sense. By the way, look at some of these Lakers fans creeping in here every once in a while, like <laughs> MVita 916 saying we're delusional. Uh, how are we delusional? Uh, the last I checked this, uh, this team won four titles in eight years and they're on track to win five and nine. If uh, the referees don't help your team out in the process. Uh, <laughs> anyways, you guys are, you guys are, uh, you're entertaining. I don't know how else to really spin that. So look, I'm feeling confident about game four. I really am. I, I'm, I have zero concern. Granted, I'm going to be paying damn close attention to that game because it is vitally important. The season might be on the line, but with that said, um, I, I'm incredibly confident that the dynasty uh, will not fall to this Lakers team. Even though the Warriors lost by 30 tonight, um, that score to me is not indicative of who these teams are. Um, I'm going to predict a solid uh, comeback game in game four. I have no idea if we're going to see Kaminga, but nonetheless, I, I, I trust Stephen Curry. I trust uh, Draymond Green. I trust this team to do the, to make the right plays and to not repeat the mistakes they made tonight. Even though uh, there isn't much you can do about the officials, there's a lot you can do when it comes to turnovers, um, which were horrible. And, and I'll say this about Poole, and let me know if, how you feel about this. To me, for this series, it's got to be either uh, Poole or DiVincenzo. Like, I don't think you can afford to go with both those players. I, I just I just don't think those two players combined give you enough. Uh, you know, DiVincenzo at least is a two-way player. Uh, he plays solid defense. Um, his value, obviously, is, is, is awesome when it comes to ball handling. Um, he's not a liability on that side of the floor. He's clearly not a playmaker like Jordan Poole is. Um, but I, I know what you're saying about Poole. He was the sixth man on a world championship team, but he looks like a liability out there. He played 15 minutes in game two, and I, I don't think there's a coincidence that he played less minutes and the Warriors were successful um, as a result. So that's my that's my feeling on it. I don't know if you agree. Uh, any response to that and any final thoughts uh, about game four and tonight? No, I, I agree with what you say on pool. I think it's just you got to have him on a little bit of a short leash. I think uh, – and as far as the pool, DiVincenzo lineup goes, I would say that now down two to one, you've kind of lost that luxury to yeah. just think, okay, I'm going to sneak in some extra rest for Clay Thompson and, and Stephen Curry. Like in game one, it was okay. In game two, they responded great. I think you've lost that luxury now in game four and maybe if in game five is going well or you have a 3-2 lead, you can kind of play with the minutes a little bit more. But let's just also say that the best player on the Warriors gets better as the series goes on. Like, this guy doesn't get tired. And to be fair, LeBron James might have the same effect because of what he's doing at age 38. But I think this every other day play is more likely to favor the Warriors than it is the Lakers because they are such a rhythm team that's gone through this so many times. And tonight, they got completely disrupted of their rhythm. It just got snapped out of them. 
right in the second quarter. Halftime didn't provide the reset that I was hoping for. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's kind of my response to your uh, final thoughts on the game. I love it, man. And, and Greg, I hope you come back on the show regularly. I, I think you're a phenomenal guest. Um, your dad's brilliant. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think the apple's falling far, far from the tree in that regard. Follow Greg Silver on Twitter at Greg. Oh, so what is the O for, by the way? Cause you, every time I see that, O, uh, there's a song, um, that came out in like the eighties, uh, where one part of it, you hear and entry dice clay in the background. Go, oh, and it's called like you're unbelievable. Do you know the song I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. I know exactly that song. That's, that's a great call. Um, the quick uh, summary of that is that uh, it's not my middle initial. Uh, people would call me Gregorio when I was younger because that's the oh, Spanish okay. version of Greg. And then uh, one of my friends at a summer camp just shortened that to Grego. And uh, gotcha. that's just kind of where I got it from. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> what is that song, man? I'm, I'm like drawing a, an old man brain fart on that. But um, every time I see your Twitter, I'm always like, Greg, oh, but, but now it's Grego. So, so now I know. So there you go. But it's by uh, it's by EMF. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, again, Dub Nation, uh, don't hit the panic button, please. Uh, I, I'm not stressing at all. I, to me, it's very clear who the better team in this series is. But it's also very hard to win when you're on the road and you're playing LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and the refs. It, it gets a little much. So, um, I, I but at the same time, I'm not panicked about Game Four at all. Uh, confidence is there, at least from my perspective. Uh, Greg, are you confident in Game Four? Do you think the Warriors win? Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yes. I love it. Sounds good. All right, folks. Thank you so much for joining us again. Follow Greg Silver on Twitter at Greg O Silver. Uh, subscribe to his podcast screaming from the sidelines. Um, and otherwise crappy night, but it's only two one. We have a game four coming up in just two days. Thanks, Greg. Pleasure, man. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Cyrus. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah take care, everyone.